Hi, my name is Ryan Languish, and this is Ludo Lodge, a channel about sparking growth in your journey as a game designer. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the prototyping tool Component Studio 2, walking through some basic examples of its usage and creating cards within the tool, and then giving some of my first impressions based on my experiences so far. For some initial context, Component Studio 2 is a web-based tool that allows you to create components for tabletop or board games, whether that be tiles or cards or boards. Um, it gives you a lot of functionality to allow you to create these components more efficiently, kind of tighten up your uh, iteration loops as you make changes to these components, and then provide an easy path to kind of publishing these components, whether that's, you know, pushing it to a, a physical prototype or a digital prototype or actually, um, you know, printing a copy of the game. Which actually brings us to the creator of Component Studio 2, which is the Game Crafter, which you may be familiar with as a leader in the tabletop space for print-on-demand board game services and self-publishing. And so this tool is something that they've built to kind of, um, you know, provide these this functionality to board game designers, but also kind of feed nicely into their pipeline of other board game production services. So depending on how much time you've spent in the board game design space and how familiar you are with some of the tools that are available to game designers, you may or may not be aware of kind of the core problem that Component Studio is trying to solve here. When you're creating a board game design, there's, there's two things that tend to be true. One is that it takes a lot of iteration and testing and changes and testing and changes um, to land on a final design. And the second thing is that board games tend to have a lot of physical components, you know, whether it be decks of cards or tiles. And these components tend to have a lot of, you know, information on them um, or data that's that's determining what the names and the images and the stats are of these different components. And when you put those two things together, the result is you are going to have to keep making changes to these components and depending on how you've generated them that could be really really painful you know if you've made all of these um, cards for example in a drawing program and then you make some substantial change to your game based on testing you're now in a place where you have to go back and change every card card by card to apply that change to your design and you end up wasting a ton of time just doing that kind of busy work and so what Component Studio 2, as well as other um, software solutions, aim to solve for game designers is kind of decoupling that concept of the data and the design of components. And so typically, um, the data gets represented as kind of a spreadsheet. You can think, you know, Google Sheets or Excel, where that each row is kind of defining a card and the traits of that card. And then you have the design that that is what takes that spreadsheet as input and knows how to generate a design from it. And that decoupling means that now you can change the data in the spreadsheet and not have to change the design. Like if you tweak a bunch of costs or other or text on cards, you can change that in the spreadsheet. Or say you want to move something in the design, like I want something to be represented on a different part of the card, I can change that in the single layout instead of having to change it on a per card basis. And then by running our spreadsheet back through our design, we're able to generate all of those cards. So that's kind of the core concept here in the efficiency gain. Now there are a lot of features offered by um, something like Component Studio 2 that layer on that and give you more and more. And this video is definitely not gonna get into kind of like the extent of what it's offering you, but hopefully it'll get a basic idea um, of what Component Studio 2 has to offer, the basic kind of workflow um, within it. And then, like I said at the end, I'll give some of my kind of personal thoughts based on just some early impressions of usage so far. Um, but without further ado, let's just jump in. This is going to be kind of a casual walkthrough session, um, but hopefully it'll give a good idea of kind of, you know, what a workflow might look like in Component Studio 2. Also, like I said, I am not an expert in this so far. I have spent, you know, a couple weeks on and off messing around with it and, you know, figuring things out. So hopefully this goes smoothly, um, but you guys are along for the ride with me. What we're looking at right here is kind of the homepage for Component Studio. And I should mention it's Component Studio 2. This is kind of the second iteration on this software. Um, there, Anywhere you see CS1 is going to be kind of the first um, deprecated version of this. Like Component Studio 2 is definitely, you know, the future um, for this tool. 
And so I have an account here and you'll need an account and it, I will mention up front, I'll talk about this more in some of my impressions, um, but it is a subscription-based um, piece of software that is all in the browser. Um, so it's all web-based and you know all your data is kind of backed up in the cloud, but it is a subscription service, meaning that you're paying, I believe right now it's, it's a $10 a month subscription to you know use this system. But once you have an account here, I can go to my games page, and this is gonna be kind of the landing page um, for working in Component Studio 2. And you can see I have a few projects here, some different things I was testing, kind of importing old projects just to kind of learn the system here. Um, we're gonna actually create a new one for this tutorial um, and kind of go from scratch. So if I create a game here, I can give it a name. Um, we'll call it Luda Lodge Tutorial. And that's gonna add it to the list here. And then we can click edit, or actually it's gonna bring me right in. And this is now kind of the, the landing page within a game. And so I have a bunch of different options here. Let's kind of walk down this sidebar um, of what's available here. The first is designs. That's that second piece that I was talking about. That's the defining a layout that knows how to you know, read in spreadsheet data and spit out components. And so that's where you're gonna kind of actually be visually designing components. Data set is the first piece, right? That's your spreadsheet. That's where you're actually defining the data of the cards um, that will be used by those designs. So those are kind of the two key pieces. Then you have some other kind of um, secondary things here that come into play. Font palette is what's gonna allow you to um, bring different fonts into the project and access them within your designs. There's a notes section here that's literally just a free text if you wanted to kind of keep some notes within this um, dashboard um, for your game. Some settings, um, just some basic things like the name uh, and whether it's archived. Archives is where you're gonna be able to kind of create backups, um, generate backups that you could download um, that would allow you to restore you know, to a certain point of your project in Component Studio. Exports is gonna be where we actually get kind of the output of this whole process of the designs and data sets. When we generate the cards, we can get exports and we'll talk about some of the different formats that you can be exporting in. And lastly, we have collaborators, which um, is actually a really cool feature. I haven't messed around with it at all, but a way to be able to add somebody as a collaborator on your project that doesn't necessarily have a license to Component Studio 2. So I could definitely see this being something I use if I'm um, you know, co-designing or working with somebody on a project um, and we want to kind of like facilitate our component creation through here. But for our basic example, I'm actually gonna use the same, uh, roughly the same example that I used back for um, a tutorial I did for the software Nandec, which is actually kind of a similar space um, as far as what it's trying to solve. Um, and it's just gonna be some really basic dummy data um, cards here. And so let's actually jump to data sets first, because that's kind of where you would typically start is you're gonna kind of define the data that then you is gonna be used in the layout. So let's create a data set. And here, I'm just gonna name it cards. If you had a more complex game, you might have multiple data sets for different types of components. And so you might wanna give them better names than cards. Um, but let's jump in here and see what kind of the data set editor looks like. And as I mentioned before, we're really here just working with spreadsheet data. You got rows representing cards, columns are representing the you know, properties of those cards. And you can see here by default, we just have one card, quantity, and name. Now these are both required properties in Component Studio, where quantity is saying, you know, how many of this card gets generated. That's a very common thing with a lot of games that an identical card has more than one copy in the game. And then name is something you could use, you know, it could actually be the name of the card. It could just be something kind of behind the scenes um, that's defined here, but it is something that Component Studio 2 requires. Now you can from here, completely, you know, within Component Studio 2, build out your spreadsheet data. So there is the options to add rows. I think there's a limit to how many you can add at once. And so if you wanna add a ton, you gotta to kinda of like click this a few times. You can add columns and define the names and the types and everything. That said, personally, I think the, the better way to go, or at least the way I, I feel like I would go with my own projects, is to use something like Google Sheets, um, which is obviously going to be a way more powerful spreadsheet editor. I mean, it's unfair to expect Component Studio 2 to recreate something like Google Sheets. 
Um, but I like working in something like that that just makes it really easy to work with my spreadsheet data. I can even do some things like data aggregation, like, you know, if I want to do some, you know, count how many of these types of cards I have and kind of like calculate some things within my spreadsheet. I have all those options within something like Google Sheets. And fortunately, Component Studio 2 makes it super easy to import CSV data. So comma separated variable data. You can see the options here. You could just import a raw CSV. The option here I'm going to kind of recommend and walk through here is if you're working with a Google Sheet, you can actually import that Google Sheet directly by the URL, by kind of the shared link. And so you can end up in a nice workflow for where, you know, you're still changing the data in Google Sheets, but then just coming here and like resyncing it to get it into Component Studio 2. It is nice that it's all editable within Component Studio 2, because if I'm working on something and I just see a little something that needs a change, I can like change it on the fly without needing to do that resync. That said, if you know your Google Sheets is your source of truth, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're, you know, propagating changes back and not just making them here. It's maybe a personal preference thing uh, with workflow, but for my example here, this is how we're gonna kinda walk through it. So let's jump over into Google Sheets where I already have whipped up here. Um, an example. So you'll notice I have quantity and name because I did mention that those are required. So I just have, you know, okay, we're going to have different amounts of these different cards. The names in this case are actually going to be the names that I'm going to use for the cards. And then I just have like some super generic dummy data of like these cards are going to have a cost. These cards are going to have a description ability. And then image here will kind of explain how I got this and what I'm doing here um, when we talk about importing images into Component Studio 2. Um, but then the top row here is just the names of these properties that I'm defining. And so then from two, row 2 onward, each of these represents a single card in my data. And so to get this into Component Studio 2, we are going to want to share this and make sure that anyone with the link can view. So I actually have already done this. Um, so you want to make sure that anyone the link can view, and then you're going to want to copy that link. And once you do that, you are going to be able to go back to Component Studio and go to the Import Google Sheet option and enter that link. Um, it warns you that this is going to, you know, this import's going to overwrite anything you had in here. We're fine with that. We're going to pull fresh data. It gives me one more chance to back out if I'd like. And voila, we have all the data within here now. The only thing that's going to kind of um, matter now for um, syncing things up is potentially the like types of columns. Most of it, Component Studio 2 can kind of figure out like, okay, this is text, this is um, no, an integer, this is a number value. Um, but in the case of the image over here, this is we're actually wanting to link it to an image that we've uploaded in Component Studio 2. So let's actually talk a little bit about how that's working and why I've defined you know, my images this way. So when we want to add images into Component Studio, we're going to want to come up to images here and we can create folder. It kind of gives you, again, I'm going to um, not really use specific organization here. If you had a bigger project, you might have well-named folders. Um, but I can add in images here. So I'm going to go and I have some examples here. Let's grab for now these four. And it's going to upload those into kind of now, this is just my bank of, you know, images that I've imported. I could switch between folders if I had other folders. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other options here, but these are now available to be used and referenced um, by my designs. And you'll notice that, um, actually, if you click this little uh, clipboard icon thing, I think it's a clipboard, um, it has some options here that you can like get a value and one of those is URL and you can see I can copy it and this is what it looks like. It's got the brackets images.sword.url. So that is what I'm talking about when I got these values. So when I enter this as the value, I'm basically saying I want to link directly to the URL in Component Studio for this image. Now, getting back to how we imported this from Google Sheets, right now, Component Studio 2 doesn't know that I'm trying to reference an image here. For all it knows, this is just like a text field, <laughs> you know, just like our description. So we actually are going to want to come here and change the column type. Um, and so right now, see, it thinks it's text. There's color, number, true, false, and then image URL. We definitely want 
image URL. And upon save here, we're actually going to see that it immediately makes those links and shows us within the spreadsheet, which is something that's kind of nice compared to, you know, Google Sheets. We kind of get a visual here um, that it's linking to those. And so, you know, as long as I keep these values in my Google spreadsheet, and as long as I name, you know, the images the same way, like I could swap out maybe as this game develops, I get like better artwork. This is just prototype stuff. Um, as long as I uploaded the same thing as sword, this link would remain the same and it would reference it the same way. So at this point, we kind of have our data. Um, and that's kind of what we need now to go into the building out of a layout. And so from here, we're going to go back to game. We can see our single data set here with four rows, total quantity 12. So that's calculating the total amount of cards based on that quantity property for each row. And we're going to want to go back to designs and create our first design. So in this case, I'm going to call it card because I'm lazy. Component type, we're going to stick with poker deck, which is just like basic cards. But this is a good example of where this is a direct tie-in to the game crafter. And so like if you were planning to produce a physical version of this through the game crafter, these would directly tie to what, you know, the inputs for that production process is going to look like. And so, you know, if I build this out with poker deck, it is going to be exactly right and ready to if I wanted to print it as a poker deck um, through the game crafter. And so there's all kinds of options here, right? Because they have a lot of different things that you could produce. We're just going to stick with uh, poker deck for now. Um, this is just defining do we want portrait or landscape? We're going to use portrait. I'm not worrying about backs of cards right now. You could, you know, have cards have unique backs where every card has a different back as opposed to like just solid backs. Not going to worry about that right now. And then we need to select a data set. What is the data set that's associated with this design? In this case, cards that we just created is what we want. So upon creating a design, we're going to see that here now, card, poker deck, and we can now enter the editor um, for this design. And this is kind of the big, you know, piece of Component Studio 2 is kind of this layout editor that's letting you edit the layout of cards so that it can generate it from that data set. And so what we see on the left here, and I might zoom out a little bit, this is like our card and it's showing us kind of the size and where it's actually going to cut and the, the trim area of like where's the safe area um, to print text or other things, which is a lot more important considerations when you're getting to the point of actually considering printing anything physical. Um, but let's just get a way of land of what we're looking at. So we've got a preview here. Up here we can see attack in this drop down. These are our different cards. So right now we have four different cards in our game. And right now if I switch between them, nothing changes because there's nothing in our layout yet. So every card is just blank at this point. But once we start defining some of these things, we should be able to kind of toggle between our different cards. Um, front versus back of the cards, so you could have different designs for both. In this case, um, you know, we're not worrying about the back. You could toggle off that overlay if you, you know, don't want to be seeing that at any point in time. And then you actually can, you know, while we're going down the line here, you could edit the data directly here. So like if I change this quantity to six, it would actually change that value in my data set, my spreadsheet for that first row, that attack row. Um, so that can be a nice way to make quick changes if you notice things like while you're in here without having to go back to the data set. You also can force a reload of the data set. You know, if you have multiple tabs open, you make changes elsewhere and you want to reload it here. But let's jump into this section here, which is what is going to define our layout. And so everything is made up of layer groups that have children layers. Um, and each of those layers is a different type that defines what's represented on the card. So in this case, just so you know kind of what we're shooting for, I'm thinking a basic kind of black header rectangle on the, or a black border along the top with a left square that shows the cost. So you can imagine like in the top left, it shows a three or a four. Then in the rest of the header, it shows the name of the card. Then we want the image nice and big in the middle and the description text underneath it. Just a really basic card layout. So let's name this group header row. Um, and I'm gonna do this just so I can show kind of like some of the functionality that you can get out of a group. And so right now this group has no layers underneath it. And so we wanna add a layer. And so this is the different options that layers could be. 
In this case, the first thing I'm going to try to do is get that box that I want, you know, kind of to outline where I'm going to put the data. So I'm going to use a box. So we get a nice big red box here and we get some options to edit it. While we're thinking of it, let's give it um, a name. I'm not thinking too much about these names here. And then we're going to want to get this um, size and position to what we want. So right now it is got a position of left zero, top zero, so that's like the top left. And then the width and height is actually using a variable that's saying whatever the design width is and the design height. So that's calculating to 825 and 1125. And so that's what's the full card right now. So we, you know, probably still want, um, actually let's play with the safe area here. Let's say that we wanted our rectangle to be completely within the safe area. So how do we figure out, you know, what the left value is for kind of this here? You know, we can kind of ballpark it here. The better way to do it is to use the little three dots here. And a lot of these fields have this, which kind of gives you this um, way to access some of the um, built-in functionality and find what you want to kind of calculate a value. So in this case, I want to actually get a value from the design. And that one is going to be safe left. So I want like the left in the, or X value of the safe zone. So I'm going to select that. It's going to say that it copied that to the clipboard. I am then going to enter that. And you can see it now auto calculates that to 75. And you can see our red rectangle came right up against that now, which is exactly what we want. We can do the same thing here. Let's get safe top and enter that. And we get that brought down to there. Beautiful. So then we are going to want to get the width and height correct. Um, the width is going to be safe width, right? Because it's just the width of that safe area. So if we enter that, we get that. We're just slowly seeing it come into place here. And then the height is going to be kind of arbitrary. It depends kind of what we want, how big we want that header row. So this might be a value we just kind of play with. Like, let's see, what does 200 look like? That's pretty reasonable. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't really matter too much right here. So we'll use that. Um, there's certainly some other options you could be doing here. We're not going to get too in the weeds. We do not want it to be red, though. We do not like this. So instead, we are going to have no fill here at all because we instead want to have a border. So now we can't see it. But let's go and add a border that has a stroke type of a color. And so now we have a very thin black border. Black is fine, but let's make it, let's try 10 pixels. Okay. So there's a nice chunky black rectangle. Um, and you know, we could do things like, instead of having square corners, we could, uh, you know, <laughs> do something like fill it or the round the corners, you know, a little nicer. You could change the corner radius. I mean, you, the, I'm going to I'm gonna like accidentally get too into the weeds just because I'm going to see a bunch of options that you have here. But it's fun to kind of play around with everything you have here. But let's try to not get too into the weeds. <laughs> um, and we have the basic thing that we were looking for here. So the second thing I said I wanted was, was kind of a square um, to add in the cost there. So that's going to be very similar to our header box. So I'm actually going to use the duplicate feature or copy, and I want to copy that to the same layer. Let's give this a new name. Um, let's call it cost box. And this is going to be almost the same, except instead of our width being the full width, we want it to be a square. So we want it to be the same as the height. And so just like that, we now have our, our square here for the cost. So that's great. That's kind of just like, you know, you could have done this in a drawing program. This is just kind of like things around our data. Now we want to actually start putting data in because at this point, our cards all still look the same. Um, we want to start using some of that spreadsheet data on our cards. So let's go ahead and add a text layer. So it's going to default here um, to this is some text and it shows you that you can actually use some of this HTML formatting um, to do things like bold or italics and it's actually going to be a big thing later with um, kind of just how you style in general. Um, but let's figure out what text we want to be shown here. So we're going to start with the cost. And so just like before, we were able to come in and look at the design um, and find the appropriate variables here. 
there's going to be another option here called row, which is how you're going to access any of the uh, data in your spreadsheet. And so if I go to row, I'm actually going to see all of the column properties that I have defined in that, that spreadsheet. So here we're interested in cost, which is going to copy that to my clipboard. And you could, like if you know Component Studio too well enough, you could just type this in, but it's pretty quick to be able to like just click here and click here to copy. Because um, then I can enter this and we can see that it's calculating to three. Now, if we step through our different cards, you can see that the number is changing because that data is different for each card in the spreadsheet. So we are onto something here. However, that does not look very good. So let's do some positioning. Now, there's this move option here, which is kind of nice because it lets you grab and move this. Now you're gonna notice something that looks a little weird. The three is like nowhere near where my cursor is dragging. And this kind of confused me when I was first messing around and I realized what I was doing wrong and kind of my not understanding what was happening here. The reason that it looks like I'm not grabbing the three is because the move is gonna grab at the center of the entire defined layer which isn't necessarily just my three. Right now, my layer is defined with the width of the entire safe area and a height of the safe area. We can actually go down here and show the outline if we toggle this on. Here, it's gonna make it a lot more clear when we drag, let me try this again. When we drag here, oh, I guess that the border doesn't move while I'm dragging, but you can see this border here, you know, the three is just way up in the top left of it. There's a lot more to this layer. So what I could do is I, you know, could make this the 200, 200 that we actually made our square. And now I can, you know, position this uh, within here if I'd like. I could obviously position this using um, the like just setting the left top and right. I also can do some text formatting to get this more centered. You know, there's a lot of things you could be doing here to get like the result. And there's probably like a good way to do it of actually getting this layer completely centered and then centering this within the layer. Um, I'm not going for perfection here. I'm going for uh, just kind of quick run through of things. Um, so let's call that good. That's kind of where we want it. It's a little small though. And so now is a good time to talk about some of the text formatting. Right now, this text has a default style of body. And we have some different options here. Like we could give it, you know, header one, which would be kind of the bigger, biggest we can go here. But maybe that isn't good enough. That isn't really what we want there. What if we want it, you know, to be a very specific size? How are we gonna do that? And that's where Component Studio 2 is gonna allow you to define your own styles. And so if I open up the styles here, which also is accessible always from the top menu, you can see that these are just the defaults, but we can create our own styles. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's just call it cost. Like this is gonna be the style for cost. And now I can change anything I want about it. Like I can say the font size is gonna be 128. And actually before I get too far here, I'm actually gonna change this to be cost because it's gonna make it a little easier for us to see what we're doing here. Um, so I kind of like that size, that looks nice. So let's get that kind of centered. Um, and then let's go and see what other style options we have. You know, we could go ahead and give it a font color if we want. We could uh, give it an outline stroke thickness, drop shadow. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do here. Um, I'm not gonna get, you can obviously think of kind of some of the things you would be able to do with this, but I think I basically got what I want here, which is just a big number in that box. I'm kind of shooting for quick and dirty prototype that I'm trying to whip up here. So we've got our cost there, and if we go through the different options, it looks nice for all of them and has all the different numbers. So let's move onward, and actually before we go, let's give this a quick name. This is gonna be cost. Um, and then let's duplicate that. And let's do name, which is going to be the same. I keep clicking the wrong thing here. Same thing, except we're going to want the text to be different. Instead of row cost, we're going to want, I think I called it description. Look at that. We don't want this to be that style anymore because that's really big. Let's try going back to body and see what it looks like. 
Um, the other problem here is this is inheriting that smaller size of 200 and 200 that we used before, which is causing the text to wrap. So we don't really like that. Let's use some math skills to figure out kind of what the size of this area is. Um, so first of all, we know that this left area is basically the safe left. Oops. Um, but then it's plus 200. So here's an example of where I can actually, the fact that it's in within these double brackets kind of means that it's gonna compute the final value. So we can actually do modifications within that to compute it. So you can see it's now doing the left plus 200 to get this final value, which is gonna be right here. Um, our height or our uh, top looks fine, though technically if we were being you know, I, w I wasn't very uh, diligent on my cost positioning, but technically if we were being diligent here, you know, we would say safe top for our, um, you know, to really align it perfectly. And then we're going to want our height to be 200, I believe. And our width is going to be safe width minus 200. Am I using my brain here? Okay, I think that did it, right? Because it's the whole thing minus the 200 of the square. So now we're to the point where we're kind of, you know, the right size. Um, we could, I think in the text formatting, and this is this would be the way, this is the way I should have done it with the cost, is just make the box the size here. And then for the alignment, I want to align it center and then vertical align it middle. And then that's going to be right here. Now I'm realizing, <laughs> I've been so caught up in all the settings here that I picked the completely wrong property, right? We don't want the description shown up here. We want the name. So we need to go back to text and change this to name. Much better, attack. And I think that looks pretty good then. I mean, it could look better, but it gets the job done. We have our different names here. Um, and it's always gonna center it because we you know, create, filled the full space and then always centered in both directions. Um, so I'm liking how that's looking. Let's not dwell on it. But now's a good time, now that we have kind of defined everything in this header, to show the um, functionality of this group position. So because we made a layer group and put these all within the group, one of the advantages there is now we can move that layer as a single entity. So I can like grab this um, and I can move it and it'll move it all. So I don't have to worry about like moving one thing. Um, you know, I can move everything. Um, we do not want to move it though, but just wanted to show that capability of putting things in groups lets you kind of move everything together, um, which can be useful. Let's go ahead and go to images though. So we're kind of done with this header row. Let's just make a new one for our image. Um, we'll just call it image group. And we are going to want an image layer. So it throws in a really big placeholder here. Let's get our positioning and size more like what we want. Um, so let's see. I'm going to set the, we're going to have it be square, but let's set the height to just, so let's play with some things here. 300, maybe too small. 400. Eh, let's give it a 450. I'm just going to use the quick and dirty move here because I'm lazy. If I was really being serious, I would probably, you know, calculate exactly the halfway point here and put it there. But again, if you were just like trying to get a prototype to the table quickly, you don't want to be spending too much time being pixel perfect. Like you just need something that works, which is where this move comes in handy a lot because you can just kind of throw it where you, where you need it to be. Um, I think everything else here is good other than we're not showing the right image, right? We're just showing the CS for everything. We need it to reference our data set. So we're gonna come in here and we're going to set the value of the image um, to our image in our spreadsheet. So you can see this was just like hard coding, hard coding an image, which you could do, to, but then it's gonna be the same for every single card. Whereas if I do this, we now get our attack uh, image because it's calculating that from our spreadsheet. Likewise, we got defend, potion, and retrieve. Generic fantasy game. So that's nice, and that was nice and easy, and that's everything we need to get that image there. 
Um, you know, we could rename this image, <laughs> sure. And now we can go onward to getting that description in there. We are rolling. So I'm gonna call this description group, sure. We're gonna add a text. You'll notice I'm not gonna get into every option here as far as like, you know, besides being able to draw boxes, you could draw things that are circular ovals or polygons. Tables can be good for like grid-based data where you have stuff in a grid, um, but we're not gonna be using those in this example. So we are going to do description. Um, let's go ahead and get our positioning here. We're gonna show an outline. We are going to set the top to, let's do design safe bottom minus some amount. Yeah, that was pretty good. That puts it kind of right below our image. Um, and then let's set the height to, what did we do minus? I forget, um, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, we did minus 300, so we want our height to basically just be 300 to be that space there. Okay, so that's a nice section for our text. Just like we did earlier, let's center it. So I'm gonna go into text formatting, we're gonna center it horizontally, we are gonna center it vertically. Beautiful. Um, body is a fine, uh, we'll just use that for the style. We just need to be pulling our correct text. Come here, grab the row, get our description, enter it. And just like that, we basically have our cards. Other than this one, it looks pretty bad. Now, this is an example of where we can use kind of a cool feature, maybe not for like a final, you know, print of a game, but for prototyping, um, this is pretty helpful. If I remember where it is, yes, fit to size. Ready for this? Boom. With just toggling that on, it's gonna automatically resize the font to fit the box that I'm trying to go in. And I tell you, having worked you know, in other tools like this, that is a really nice feature when it's like, okay, on these prototype cards, I just want <laughs> this data represented in this section, you know, and I wanna be able to read it. I don't care exactly how it looks. Um, so by just toggling that on, we're gonna get you know, the bigger font for when it fits, uh, but when it doesn't fit, we get it all you know, fit to size. Let's toggle off the show outline here that we don't need anymore. And that is kind of it for our first pass at these cards. I can toggle off the overlay here if you kind of want to see what it looks like without them. You know, we don't have another border here or anything. Um, these could certainly look better, but they get the job done. So at this point, what you're likely wanting to do next is actually use these cards, you know, to test them out. And that could look like a few different things. It could be you want to do a physical prototype or a digital prototype. And that's where you're going to want to export. So you can see up here we have an export option. Um, we could just download this image, download all the images. But I'm going to look at the export dialog here, which is going to give us some pretty good options for kind of how we want to export these cards. Um, here, sides, face, back, let's just worry about face right now. We could, you know, do a subset of the, the components if we'd like. An R, this is going to create an archive, which if you remember in that home dashboard, there was an archive section that's going to kind of, you know, be, it's almost like a save file for Component Studio 2 um, of how things were at this point. Um, so you, it gives you some, if you end up saving those archives, it, it can help you that if you make future changes and want to revert, you have that uh, option. But then we have kind of, three or I guess four different um, export options here. Print and play, game crafter, tabletop simulator, and zip file of images. Um, and you could have any or all of these toggled on. So like if you wanted to export to all of these different things, you could do it all kind of in one fell swoop. Here, we're just gonna kind of focus on the print and play PDF, um, though these are certainly you know big, nice features. If you wanted to print through the game, game Crafter, this directly ties into it and would set you up to do that very quickly. If you prototype in Tabletop Simulator, which if you're watching my channel, there's a good chance of that because a lot of content I've put out so far has been about prototyping in Tabletop Simulator. This makes it really easy to export it in the format that Tabletop Simulator is gonna expect to be able to import it in. Um, or you might just want a zip of all the images. But let's go with the print and play here. We just want US letter, um, cut lines, sure, we'll have that. Let's just go with the defaults here and let's start an export. 
So when you do this, you're gonna to wanna to stay on this tab because it's all happening in your browser. So it kind of needs to be running. Don't close it or anything. It's going through all your cards and it's generating these. Now it was very quick for me because I only have four cards and you can see that it had a notification that it was finishing um, the export server side. So there's some stuff it has to do um, you know, outside of your browser on the server side to finish up. Again, that was very quick because of not very many cards. So it gave me a pop-up um, saying mine was ready. I missed that pop-up because I was talking. But if we go back here, we should be able to see one in our archives. We now have this archive here, which is going to expire in, what, 14 days or something? Um, so you have two weeks to download that if you wanted to, otherwise it's going to go away. Um, but then you're going to have your exports here. So this is where we can see that we actually got our card print and play exported and we can view it. And so if we look here, it is going to have generated all our cards. It's going to generate them according to the quantity and it's going to put them into a print and play format with our cut lines. So this is exactly what we would need to print and cut it out and begin, you know, physical prototyping. So super easy, super um, streamlined to do that. And at this point, you're, you know, if you haven't used tools like this before, this is where like it really, the rubber meets the road and kind of the efficiency gain here is I can make changes to my game and it could just be change stuff in the spreadsheet, regenerate through my layout, redownload the print and play. And like, I haven't done any custom tweaking of cards. Like it all is handled by um, the pipeline, which is a really nice place to be when you're prototyping. I know this is getting long-winded, but before we get into uh, first impressions, I wanted to highlight one other nice feature, um, which is suppose we wanted in our data set, and let's just jump into our data set here, to display some of these um, text abilities with inline icons instead of names. So for example, maybe we want damage to be like a little damage icon and, and health points to be a little health point icon. Game uh, Component Studio 2 does make this very easy. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to upload the images that we want to use for that. Um, so maybe we would make a different folder here, inline icons, we wouldn't have to. Um, let's grab the two I have here, damage and HP. Um, the change here though, is we're going to want to check this option, which if I hover says usable as inline icon in text. So this is specifically what's telling it, like we want to be able to use this within our text, not just, you know, referenced as an image. So we're going to talk or, or select both of those. And now because we've named these damage and HP, what we can do is actually put in those values as HTML tags in our description. And that's going to tell Component Studio 2 that we want those um, icons. So for example, I can do this and it's going to read this as an icon. Now, if you're not familiar with kind of HTML tag formatting, um, you know, this is kind of a shortcut for a damage tag. Technically the full tag is this. Um, it's an opening tag and a closing tag. Um, but you can shortcut it by just do, if there's nothing inside it, you could just do it like this. So typically when you're wanting to put inline icons, this is all you're going to need. Um, and so I can go through each of these and I can say, you know, I want this icon to be used here. I want HP to be used here. Good enough. Let's go back to our layout. And let's see what we've got. And just like that, without actually any changes in our layout, because we already told Component Studio that, hey, we want to use these as inline text, which that in and of itself tells it when it's reading that text in to look for those tags. And so we can see here, deal 10, damage. Block six, damage. Heal four, HP. Um, so really simple to do, and it's a very common thing, right, to be want to put that in text um, on cards. Um, and it makes it very easy to then manage that. Obviously, if I was really doing this design, I'd, I'd make those changes back in my Google Sheet um, so that I'd have those tags in here. Um, but just wanted to quick cover that because I feel like it's another base piece of functionality that's, that's nice um, to see here. Though, as I said at the beginning, we really have just scratched the surface here. Like, do not use this as a like, oh, this is everything Component Studio can do. Um, this is really just a, a very high level view of some of the basics. 
All right, well, kudos to anyone who stuck with me this far through the video, or hello again if you skipped to this point in the video. But I just want to give my initial impressions um, based on my experiences with Component Studio 2 so far. Um, keep in mind that these are very early impressions. I have not used this tool heavily through the duration you know, of a full project. Um, but I think I can give some initial thoughts um, on my use so far. Um, full disclosure, I was given a free account um, for Component Studio 2. Um, and so I'm not going to get too much into the, you know, the value and is it worth the $10 a month is a really hard question to, it's so personal, right? Like $10 a month can mean something so different for different people as far as how costly that is. You know, the value of this is very de dependent on kind of like, you know, what all your, your alternatives, how often are you doing this kind of game design? And so I think, you know, I'll, I'll hopefully give you some info that helps you kind of make that value a decision for yourself. Um, but you should know up front that I personally did not pay um, for Component Studio um, for my usage in it thus far. But jumping into my first um, kind of observation is that the workflow is really smooth. Um, you know, the whole UI and the UX, there's obviously, anytime you're learning a new tool like this, there's going to be little quirks and things you have to learn. And a lot of things in this video that maybe like, you know, I did quickly or looked smooth, you know, weren't so smooth for me the first time as I was kind of messing around with it. Now, I don't really, you know, see that as much of a downside, like, especially if you're, you know, paying for this to be kind of your tool to really, you know, work on designs, you're investing in it, right? You're investing in learning a tool to kind of get the, the dividends. Um, but that said, I did not feel a lot of friction. Usually I was able to find things um, pretty quickly just from the UI itself. When I did need to reach out um, to documentation, the documentation was good. There's actually a lot of good um, videos on the Game Crafter a YouTube channel, I'll link that, the full tutorial playlist of really well done videos that they've been putting out um, covering different stuff, which is super helpful. Um, and then on top of that, they have, um, you know, a Discord server um, with a, a channel completely, which you can get pretty direct uh, access to people who can likely answer your questions, um, as well as a Facebook group um, and forums. So like you have a lot of resources to kind of get over that hump of the learning or like, you know, if you get stuck being able to figure out kind of what your options are. Um, but like I said, I didn't have to go to that much. Like there were a couple questions I had and it was really, you know, because I was curious about some different things. Like there wasn't like a lot of things that, or really anything that like blocked my design from moving forward when I was trying to do some of these um, examples. I think another thing to call out is, and this is really in comparison to maybe other potential, you know, solutions that you could be using for this kind of prototyping is Component Studio 2 is completely web-based. This is all in my browser, right? And I see that as a huge advantage. Um, one, everything is, is kind of backed up in the cloud. Like I could be on a different computer and I can still access all my projects just the same. Similarly, if I wanted to collaborate with somebody, there's no hoop to jump through as far as how are we going to share stuff. It's like, hey, you know, it already is this thing that can be shared um, because it's hosted on the internet. Um, Another big benefit for me with it being web-based is that it allowed me to use it even while I'm on Mac. And if you recall back, for those of you that have been on the channel and maybe watch some of my Nandek videos, Nandek is a Windows only software that had been able to be used on Mac through some kind of workarounds with using Wine and I'm not gonna get into all that, but the, <laughs> the long story short is that the newest Mac OS updates have made that a much more difficult process now for that to be feasible. There are ways you could work around it, um, but it definitely for my own process was kind of a pain point of like, okay, like, you know, what are my options? And the fact that this is web-based means I, it doesn't matter if I'm on Mac or if I'm on Windows, I could switch between Mac and Windows and still be able to access my projects just the same. So for me, that was a really, really big benefit. I think another thing to call out here is that this is 100% a tool designed for game creation and game component creation. And the reason I call that out is because some of the alternatives you could be using aren't, that isn't necessarily true. So one of the, you know, maybe industry standards for this kind of work um, is InDesign by, by Adobe. And while I haven't really used it myself, um, while it's a hugely powerful tool, it's not 
specifically geared for, you know, board game creation necessarily. And so, you know, there's a lot of fluff around it that you probably don't need. You know, new features that are coming out, there's probably a lot that don't apply specifically to your use case. And that's fine. And there's a lot of people that, you know, are going to be really proficient in working in a tool like that. But there's something to be said about a tool that is 100%, you know, focused to your use case. And like, when they release new features, I can look down that list and be like, yes, all these things are improvements that apply, you know, to me and to my usage. And like, just the user experience is geared towards me um, and making it easy for what I'm trying to do. Um, so I see that as a big benefit too, as opposed to, you know, trying to learn a he maybe a heavier tool that is capable of doing it, but maybe isn't geared as specifically towards it. And related to that with updates, it's worth mentioning that as I was going through this, I was kind of jotting down just little things, feedback I'll probably pass along here at some point of just kind of my not, stuff that's not necessarily worth calling out in this video, but just little things that maybe is worth passing along to the development team. But I will mention that in the time that I started between then and making this video, there was an update released for Component Studio that literally addressed multiple things that I had jotted down. And that was just really encouraging, right? It's an active development. They're actively, you know, working to make this the tool better. Um, you know, and little things I noticed that quickly are getting fixed. Um, you know, if I'm going to commit kind of putting into learning a tool and making it my tool of choice, um, it always feels nice to know that that's supported. It's not like a dead project um, and it's actively being made better and better. And so that's all a lot of positives so far. And honestly, I don't really have a lot of negatives. There's, you know, I was putting together a list of little kind of annoyances or things as I went through, but nothing that's like was obstructing me from doing what I needed to do in the tool or that, um, you know, is really even worth calling out specifically in this video. Um, and it was encouraging to see, you know, improvements being made even in the time that I was, was kind of pre preparing for this video. Um, but you know, I think maybe it's worth just understanding like, you know, this isn't Adobe that's making this software. It's a little bit lower budget. The maturity of it is maybe, you know, still getting there and there's going to be little quirks. But I, at least in my time so far, haven't found any of that to be, you know, a deal breaker um, or prevent the tool from doing what I need it to do. Um, but I think you do have to have the right expectations, especially for a paid, you know, a subscription-based thing. You, you have to understand it's a subscription-based thing for a pretty niche, you know, product that's made by a, you know, a smaller um, team. But that, you know, I'm squarely in that niche, right? Like this is what I'm <laughs> wanting to do. Um, and so for that, it fits my needs. And maybe that's the question, you know, the final piece of feedback here, or like my impressions, um, is kind of like, what, what's my plans with Component Studio 2? And right now, my plan is to com continue using it as my primary tool for this kind of prototyping. Um, and now you, you know, could say, well, Ryan, you, you know, are getting the software for free. That makes sense. You're biased and I can't argue with that. But I'd like to think that I'm going to, you know, pick the tool that's working the best for me, um, you know, kind of whatever that might be for my, my purposes. And right now that's Component Studio 2. Um, I'm looking forward to kind of getting better at it, getting more proficient to where, you know, when I want to whip up a prototype, I can do it really, really quickly. And when I want to polish something a little more and make it, you know, I, I have the skills to do that. Um, so I'm excited to see where it goes. I hope this video, I know this this got long. I think it got a lot longer than I was anticipating. I kind of went into this uh, little loosey-goosey blind to see how it went. Hopefully, you found parts of it um, helpful, informative. If you didn't know a lot about Component Studio or, you know, were just curious about it. Um, feel free to ask any questions if you felt like there was something I didn't cover with kind of my initial impressions. Like I said, there's a great community um, with, you know, the Discord and Facebook group. Um, around using Component Studio that you can definitely, um, if you start using it, get involved in. So if you found this video helpful, give it a like, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, and I will see you in the next one.